Hello and happy Thursday, everybody. Here's what's coming up tonight on News Center Now. As you can see, we are in our Honor Flight main studios. We will give you all the information on this amazing cause and how you can help out. Plus, some serious news we will get to. There was a fire that damaged a mill in Lincoln. Turns out that was an arson. We'll have an update on that. Also, there's a doctor who is saying you can actually overdose from too much marijuana. We will give you that story. Big argument there. All right, this is New Center Now. Another former mill site in Maine goes up in flames and authorities say a former employee is to blame. Hey hello everybody, I'm Lee Goldberg. And I'm Amanda Hill. The complex that once housed the Lincoln paper and tissue mill caught fire yesterday afternoon. Investigators say it was no accident. Yeah, Tennyson Coleman joins us now live from the mill site. Hey Tennyson, how much damage is there? Well, I can tell you that officials have confirmed that two buildings have been destroyed. There were three fires that were set here last night and officials, police say that the person who's responsible is David Parsons of Lincoln. 59 year old David Parsons. He was arrested Thursday around noon for three counts of arson in connection with fires started at the former Lincoln paper and tissue mill. The blaze so big, fire departments from nearly a dozen towns responded to the call. Police say Parsons is a former employee of the mill, which is a historic landmark for many who live in the area. Stinking Lincoln, <laughs> that's what they always called it, the smell, I guess. Folks like Penny Noyce, who works just down the road from the mill, have fond memories of the building. She never worked at the mill herself, but she knows people who have. It was a way of life. It was what people depended on, you know. Just like several other old mill towns in Maine, Lincoln is still recovering from the facility's closing. And for some, it was already hard to accept that the mill had been shut down. Now this. It was sad to see something that has meant so much to the community and the condition it was in. Officials say when the fire was started around 3 p.m. Wednesday, there was a small demolition crew on hand removing equipment and cleaning up the mill. There was a skeleton crew uh, working for another company here uh, doing some cleanup. Um, exactly what they're cleaning up, I don't know. I don't have that information, but uh, I know it's part of the process of trying to determine what, what they plan on doing with the mills. Thursday, cleanup crews were still on the property cooperating with the investigation. The site of the mill in flames may haunt some folks here, but interim town manager Bruce Arnold says this town will bounce back. It's going to take a while to get over just what we saw last night, but you know, a strong group up here and they'll move on. Parsons is booked at the Penobscot County Jail. I reached out to the Penobscot County Judicial Center to find out when he will first appear in court. That information is not available yet. Live in Lincoln, Tennyson Coleman, News Center. All right, Tennyson, thank you very much. Now, if you're wondering why there's a phone number at the bottom of your screen, here's your answer. It's because today is the New Center Honor Flight Maine Telethon. You can call the number right now to make a donation to send Maine's World War II, Vietnam, and Korean War veterans to Washington, D.C., so they can finally see the memorials that have been built in their honor. We'll have much more from the telethon coming up a little later on on now. All right, it's looking a little more wet than white outside for most people right now. Yeah, as far as snow goes, just want a big swing and a miss, huh, Casey? Yeah, not much heavy snow out there. Even the mountains, it amazed me. I just saw Sugarloaf had changed over to rain, which is a bad sign, obviously. Most of us rain. We knew that would be the case along the coastline. That battleground, though, to the west of 95 has easily seeded itself to rain. As you can see, it's pushed uh, well west of Waterville and again into Rumford and Eustace. I do think we'll see a little collapsing of this rain snow line back towards 95. But at this point, it's very hard to accumulate snow because it's been raining for hours. So the boundary layer temperatures are relatively warm. Up to the north, Dover Foxcroft is in the rain right now. Even green pockets of rain and snow mixed in. So the biggest accumulation obviously across northern Maine at this point. Storm moves out 
through late tonight, early tomorrow morning, a couple snow showers in the mountains. It is a bright day by tomorrow afternoon, but windy. Wind gusts once again will be in the 40s or so for miles an hour, and then we start as a decent day on Saturday. Another storm system, guys, comes our way Saturday night and into Sunday. That is going to be uh, a possibility of rain and snow mixed once again. And one more time, gusty winds. That's been a theme so far this fall. Blustery day in the 100 acre wood. <laughs> Teams from FEMA are in Maine this week surveying damage from that windstorm. Yeah, these assessments will help Governor LePage decide whether or not to ask for federal assistance in the cleanup. Chris Costa shows us why Maine is a long way off from possibly receiving that federal funding. Crews from FEMA are spread across the state evaluating damage like this left by the windstorm that knocked out power to almost 500,000 people across Maine at its peak. Seemed like a month, believe me. It was rough. Maureen Waterman had no electricity for five days after the windstorm, but she can laugh about it now. You don't realize what you miss until you don't have it. I know. Yeah. TV, that's my <laughs> life. A cracked sidewalk and an uprooted tree near her home is one area FEMA crews look at as they gather damaged data across Maine. We're here to see whatever damage that they want to show us, and we're committed to being here as long as it takes to accomplish that. This money could help state and local governments. Even companies like Central Maine Power and Emera could have up to 75% of their cleanup costs covered by the state. Crews that spent hours trying to get the lights back on. But this surveying or preliminary damage assessment is only about halfway through the process until the state actually gets the money. After these PDAs, the Maine Emergency Management Agency presents the findings to Governor LePage. Then he decides if he will request a federal disaster declaration. After FEMA reviews it, it passes the declaration request on to President Trump, who will decide if Maine will receive the federal funding. If the president denies the request, the cost would likely fall on local and state governments. Well, they'll just go up on our taxes. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> so it sounds like you'd rather have it covered by the federal government. Hey, at this stage of my life, what do I care, you know? <laughs> In Portland, Chris Costa, News Center. And once the state hits the threshold of $1.9 million in damage, it's eligible for a federal disaster declaration. If Maine gets these federal funds, it would only be for state and local governments to use. New Hampshire and Vermont are also vying for these funds. A MEMA spokesperson says it's unlikely that Mainers could receive individual assistance from the federal government because of the lack of widespread damage to their homes. All right, when we come back, we are checking in with our Honor Flight Maine telethon. Amazing. It, 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 I can't, I haven't got enough English language to explain how I feel, really. I feel like, like explosions. <laughs> Maybe a few tears. Glad you're here. Yes, I am. Every veteran deserves to have an experience like this. Help us achieve our goal to send a plane of veterans to Washington, D.C. Details right after the break. All right, our Honor Flight Maine Telethon continues for only a few more hours. I'm here with Don Kerrigan. You've been here all day. I have. We've been here since 5 o'clock this morning. Tremendous amount of fun. Just a fantastic group of people back here, all volunteers, as well as our veterans who are helping make this happen. Over $57,000 raised so far. Uh, that It takes $700 to send a veteran to, with Honor Flight Maine to Washington. Just We're going to be able to, to load a... That's about a plane and a half worth of veterans. We want to keep going, get a few more. Keep going, yes, because last year I believe we raised more than a hundred thousand dollars. Yes, and several trips this year, uh, financed by those donations, with another one coming in April. So people have been very generous. Uh, the numbers are on our screen in Bangor and in Portland, and uh, so we hope people can call and donate. And I think. Speaking of Bangor. <laughs> well, before we go oh, to yes, Bangor, right. John, Sorry. we do want to mention a lot of people have been donating, including small businesses in Maine. Becky's Diner on Commercial Street in Portland promised to donate half of all of today's sales to Honor Flight Maine. The diner actually raised $8,000 in sales today, so that means 4000 of that will be coming here. But Becky herself has decided she will make it an even 5000 which is great. So Becky's daughter, Kate Madden, says that for their family, raising money for this cause is actually personal. A few years ago, my grandfather, who was a World War II veteran, got to go on the honor flight. Um, and my mom accompanied him as his chaperone. And she said the whole experience was surreal. Um, it was amazing how many 
um, you know, rounds of applause they got and serenades they got, and it was just a real magical experience for my grandfather, who had never been to Washington, D.C., and for my mother to get to witness how amazing these veterans were treated on this experience. All right, it's getting louder in here because these phone lines are just yeah, ringing off the hook. All our operators are, uh, phone answerers are talking to people, which means donations are coming in. Right. We are in Portland, but Bill Green is in Bangor, where we're also having this telethon. Yep. It's a wonderful experience up here as well, and we want to call on you, Eastern Maine, as you can't duck under it. It's too big. We're having fun. The phones here are ringing off the hooks as well as Mainers respond, just as our sons and daughters responded during times of crisis. And we're going to send people to Washington for Honor Flight Maine. Please call the numbers on your screen. Eastern Mainers, call those Bangor numbers, and we'll be adding it up and telling you about what the money is used for and all the good that it does coming up later in our News Center broadcast. Right now, back to you in the studio uh, as the Honor Flight Maine telethon continues. Thanks, Bill. Bill and I started our career about 75 years ago up in Bangor. We're there together, so a lot of great memories. Great job by those folks up there as yeah. and well as the volunteers here. Right, right, and this will continue. Lee, we're going to send it back to you for now. All right, Amanda with the Hall of Fame lineup there, Don Kerrigan and Bill Green. Well done. Doctors in Colorado believe that a little boy died from a marijuana overdose. The kid never really got better, and just one thing led to another, and the kid ended up, the heart stopped. Why they believe the drug is to blame, even though other medical professionals say it isn't even possible. And if you have any branches still dangling, you better take care of them. Keep this tracking some wind speeds coming up in the forecast. Okay, so no one has ever died of a marijuana overdose. That's an accepted fact of modern medicine. Yeah, but now two doctors in Colorado are starting a debate over that question. They claim that their patient, a baby boy, actually died of an overdose on marijuana. Brandon Rittman explains their argument and the arguments that other doctors have against it. The case in question happened in 2015, the second year of recreational marijuana sales in Colorado. An 11-month-old boy came into the ER after a seizure barely conscious. This image shows the doctors had to insert a breathing tube into the baby, but his heart began to fail. The kid never really got better, and just one thing led to another, and the kid ended up, the heart stopped, and the kid stopped breathing and died. Dr. Christopher Hoyt was on duty at the Regional Poison Control Center in Denver that day and was called to help. He and another doctor at the center set out to explain why this baby died after they saw the boy's blood and urine tested positive for marijuana. And we just wanted to make sure that we're not gonna call this a marijuana-related, you know, fatality if there was something else, you know, mm -hmm. that we could point at. And we looked and looked and couldn't find it. Which led the doctors to make what in scientific speak amounts to a very bold claim. As of this writing, this is the first reported pediatric death associated with cannabis exposure. I I'm going to have to call BS on this one. Dr. Noah Kaufman is an ER specialist who reviewed the report published in a medical journal earlier this year to give us a second opinion. That statement is too much. That is too much as far as I'm concerned because that is saying confidently that this is the first case, we've got one. And I still disagree with that. To understand the controversy, you need to know exactly how this boy died. The condition that killed him is not in dispute. The autopsy found he had myocarditis, that's inflammation, of his whole heart muscle. It pushed into the sac around the heart. And then there's fluid that builds up on the inside of that sac, and it, sometimes it doesn't allow the heart to, to, to fully expand and beat like it's supposed to normally. Doctors know that myocarditis can be caused by drugs, but more commonly, it's caused by an infection. You sound very convinced that, that marijuana killed this child. Uh, I never say 100% on anything um, because you you know you can get fooled by things. But we extensively ruled out almost every other cause that we can think of. He may be pretty confident, but I'm not. I, I I think that it's more likely that there's not a relationship. We thought it was more likely that it was something else, but we tested 
a lot of things, even things that are very rare uh, to find in kids, and we found none of those things on this kid. And the only thing that we found was a high concentration of uh, THC in this kid's urine and ended up in this kid's blood also. And that's the issue. There's no smoking gun. The doctors who made this claim could only rule out other causes. They also admit it's not unusual for the cause of a myocarditis case to go completely unexplained. And most kids who accidentally eat marijuana don't end up with serious medical problems like this. We're not getting those every single day. There are very few and far between. There's been thousands of ingestions and there's generally not, not a big problem. One thing all the doctors we talk to do agree on, if you keep marijuana products in the house, keep them out of the reach of kids, because we do know it can make them sick. But sick enough to die? We may never know, really. Brandon Ritterman, 9 News. All right, so that story comes to us from our media partners out in Denver. Yeah, this comes as Maine's legislature tries to hammer out rules for recreational marijuana and proposed social clubs. They were sent back to the drawing board, though, after Governor LePage vetoed the bipartisan bill because he said it wasn't in compliance with federal regulations. Yeah. All right, so our own right. scientists here. Interesting. That is interesting. And, and, of course, the end point was right, which is either way, you don't want kids accidentally ingesting. Right. We can, all, we can all agree on that one. Right. Of this, either way. Uh, pretty rainy out there tonight. Kind of nasty in a lot of spots. Mm. Changing over to rain even in the mountains as that rain snow line really pushes in. You know, I, I told Lee this earlier. It doesn't happen often, but the European model just got smoked by the American model this time. Uh, it was on to that warm air, and you can see it is intruded all the way north west of 95. Some really heavy stuff here. Some of this is bright banding as it uh, snow melts at the mid levels. It confuses the radar. Some of it though is downpours and then that changeover line to the northwest of Madison and way up here really even northwest of Presque Isle right now is where that rain snow line is. It is solidly rain in Bangor, Holton and it will stay that way through the rest of tonight. Temperatures not even close along the coastline. They're in the mid 40s here from Portland to Rockland. But again, what surprises me is that Berlin, New Hampshire is 39. So that warmer air has found its way, intruded all the way into the mountains and foothills. I think the mountains will change back over to snow before this is over. You can see that later on tonight, higher terrain, northern Maine, and it ends as some snow showers tomorrow morning. Tomorrow is actually a bright day for most of us, but very brief with wind gusts near 40 miles an hour. Saturday starts with some sunshine, but quickly clouding up and then a little rain and snow breaks out on Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, and then just warm sectored uh, on Sunday. So gusty winds, heavy rainfall on Sunday before some back end snow. So going back and forth, particularly in the mountains with these next couple of storms. Uh, total accumulation from this storm here, this is uh, additional, an inch or two, maybe up to three in Millinocket and an inch in Caribou. Again, this is all higher terrain in northern Maine. We're done. Didn't even change over in Augusta, uh, Portland and Rockland, and it will remain rain through the rest of the event. Wind speeds again tomorrow afternoon. They're pretty high. They're right around 40 miles an hour. Now these are gusts not sustained, so it should be uh, it's gusty, but not bad enough to do damage. And again on Sunday in the middle of that rainstorm, 45 mile per hour wind gusts. Those are a little bit more tricky, but they should be below the criteria to do damage and power outages. So that's all good news. Uh, so your extended forecast here looking like November. It does actually get relatively nice on, I think, Tuesday and Wednesday. I'm not sure entirely what the cloud cover situation will be. It's kind of a uh, messy little ridge there, but we should be around 50 degrees. <coughs> if that corresponds with sun, it will feel quite nice. So not, not too bad, bad there. And much of next week, by the way, up until uh, Thanksgiving at least, looks good. So for traveling, we should be in good shape. That is good news. Keith, Yeah. thank you very much. You're welcome. Purge of Twitter has begun, and if you don't behave, you're next. I'm Katie Ortiz, and this is your Social Stop. After Tweeps blasted the social media platform for giving out blue check marks to the accounts of white nationalists, Twitter overhauled its verification process altogether. 
but not before taking back those little blue badges from those white nationalists. Today, they acknowledged that verification has long been looked at as an endorsement, especially since the public can pitch for their accounts to be verified. While they say in reality, it's no, in no way an endorsement, but a way to let users know which accounts are genuine, like for celebrities, athletes, and other public figures. Now, Twitter's new rules allow them to de-verify, if you will, people who promote hate or violence on others based on race, ethnicity, ethnicity sexual orientation, gender identity, and the like. Now, the same goes if you threaten violence or encourage self-harm or suicide upon others. You can, however, still poke fun at others the way Senator Marco Rubio did to President Trump yesterday. Mr. President was just uh, a bit thirsty during his speech about his trip to Asia. Hey. It happens, and sometimes it's on live TV. But you might remember he made fun of Marco Rubio on the campaign trail for the same thing. Life comes at you fast, I guess. Rubio had his revenge and offered some advice, similar, but needs work on his form, has to be done in one single motion, and eyes should never leave the camera, but not bad for his first time. So far, President Trump hasn't replied to Senator Rubio. Lee and Amanda. All right, Katie, thank you very much. So it's hard to fathom the extent of the hurricane damage that we've had mm -hmm. this year. Coming up on Raindrops, though, Keith is going to show us the path of the storms in a way we have never seen before. But before we had to break, want to check in with Cindy Williams, who has a look at what's coming up at 530. Standing here playing with my hair. Didn't even know I was on camera. <laughs> at least you have her Surprise. to play with. Jeez. <laughs> We got a lot of uh, <laughs> news coming up at 5:30, including a very serious story. A convicted rapist is back in court, charged with dozens of new sexual assault allegations. Defrocked priest Ronald Paquin faces a new accuser. This time, the alleged abuse happened in Kenny Bunkport. We're going to have the latest from the court proceedings coming up. And a man in Millinocket wants to make sure no veteran is forgotten. Learn about his work to expand the Millinocket Veterans Memorial. It's all coming up in a half an hour. All right, thanks a lot, Cindy. Sure thing. No Center Now continues after the break. All right, today's Braindrops is more visual than anything. This is pretty cool. We're going to put it in motion in a moment. But this is NASA released this, and what you're seeing is particles, aerosols thrown in the air from different tropical systems. There comes Harvey. It's picking up salt and throwing it into the air. That's why you can see it on this projection. Uh, meanwhile, coming off the coast of Africa, look at that very closely. What that is is dust from the Sahara. Oh, coming wow. off, Way. being in, in picked up by, in this case, Irma. And you can see how far it can pull some of this dust offshore. Look at Irma, by the way. Remember that? That thing was an absolute beast. You can see it spinning, and then Jose is right behind it. I think this is a really interesting visualization. Look at that. It's, it's got uh, dust all the way from Africa, wow. basically halfway across the Atlantic because of the speed of the wind and it getting caught in the upper atmosphere. And there comes Maria, unfortunately, towards Puerto Rico. I just think this is a really That's cool amazing. What's visualization. This uh, some of that is probably uh, just smoke from wildfires. Oh, wow. That makes sense. Yeah. I love wow. all the raindrops, but the visual ones like this, those are my favorite. They're pretty. So pretty. Love those. <laughs> New Center at 530 starts right now.